Pelagic Ecology. This is going to be the final exam. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is likable science today. We're going to talk to a real live dis dissertation defender person uh, at UH uh, in SOAS as an ocean, ocean, oceanography student who just finished her the defense of her dissertation about Pelagic Ecology. Uh, Jessica Perelman, thank you so much for joining us today, Jesse. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. So what's it like? Um, you know, you must feel somewhat elated. You got through the whole process, five years of studying oceanography, and now you are, now you are, a, uh, what do I say, a bar mitzvah, a fountain pen. <laughs> you are a fountain pen. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's, it feels really good to be on this side of everything. Uh, five years is a long time, but certainly worth it all. That's great. So what was the five years like? Can you talk about the coursework you had to take and the research you had to do to get through it? Yeah, uh, so it's part of the oceanography department at UH. Um, I have to say, I, I really didn't have a strong background in oceanography whatsoever. And so taking all the courses was shedding a lot of light on entirely new topics for me. So um, we, you know, in this program, take the, the whole suite of courses to familiarize yourself with not only the area of oceanography that you might be focused on, but also kind of all of the areas so that you can have a general understanding of, of all of the different topics that people might be focused on. Um, so that's physical oceanography, chemical oceanography, um, my area of focus, biological oceanography. Um, so just trying to trying to get a good understanding of, um, you know, what what this field is all about. Um, and then with UH, it was about two years of coursework. So a lot of focus on really learning the basics as you're developing your dissertation research and trying to figure out what specifically within all of that suite of information that you're learning that you want to focus on and want to study. You must see, you know, um, a square foot of ocean um, as a different, um, a different thing than, than regular people see it. You must see into that square foot and see all these things happening, all these animals and microbes and what have you jumping up and down. Uh, you're not like regular people anymore, are you? No, I guess it's like, you know, I hear people say if they study film, you can never just watch a movie again for what it is. You always, you're always looking deeper. So yeah, every time I get a chance to get in the water, it's, you know, what am I seeing? What, what cool critters are in the water and where are they coming from? And how am I disturbing them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. And so I mean, you must also have a feeling about how very precious um, the ocean is and um, how very fragile the ecosystem is. I mean, how do you feel about that after five years of a PhD? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, understanding a lot more about how ocean ecosystems operate and now understanding a lot more about the pressures and the potential threats to that natural state of operation, um, it's it's concerning. It's, um, you know, there's there's a lot of changes happening. There's a lot of potential, uh, you know, industries and, and changes that might happen. So um, one of the areas that I focused on a lot was a developing deep sea mining industry. And so I guess in the back of my head throughout the last five years, it's always been that question of, you know, what's going to happen to these precious ecosystems? And, um, you know, we had, yeah, a show, we had a show about that. And it was one of the most mm -hmm. interesting shows in oceanography that we've ever mm -hmm. had. It was about manganese nodules mm -hmm. um, and about how this, you know, this industry is waiting on the sidelines to pounce on all the ocean floors in the world and mine these manganese not and other and other uh, you know other materials as well. Um, but how do you feel about that? Because I mean, there are people who will make a lot of money doing it. Um, and what does it take to protect them? And what is it, you know, what will, you know, wholesale manganese nodule mining do to the world? Those are all really great questions and ones that I've tried to grapple with for the last five years. Um, it, it is a rapidly emerging industry and there's a lot of uh, increasing demand for the kinds of metals that they want to mine from the deep sea floor. So um, I think, interestingly, you know, these manganese nodules aren't aren't mined the same way that um, a lot of land-based minerals are mined and they're not drilled for in the way that you think that oil mining or oil, oil drilling might happen. Um, these nodules are, are sitting kind of just in 
dense fields in some areas on, on the deep sea floor and parts of the ocean. So um, one area in particular is um, this massive, massive area between Hawaii and Mexico that spans about the width of the, the continental US. And I think that's one of the, the primary targets for this industry. And you know, they're figuring out the engineering uh, details of how to physically lift all these nodules several miles up from the seafloor all the way to the surface. And as scientists, you know, we're trying to ask the questions, well, what, you know, what harm is this going to have to the ecosystem? How can we mitigate that harm? Um, and, and even more basic questions of, wait, what even lives in these ecosystems? These are areas that really haven't been studied all that much. Um, how, you know, how can we assess what kind of changes or, or uh, you know, threats might be occurring in these waters if we don't even know from a baseline standpoint what's there and, and how they behave? Um, so, yeah, it, it's interesting to see this develop. You know, I'm, I'm curious to see uh, how quickly, if, if at all, this, this industry really picks up and how it might um, compete with or rival or kind of add to the existing land-based mining uh, for some of these minerals that are quite important. Yeah, I mean, manganese <laughs> is only one of them. There are a number of them and they could become, you know, in, in the 21st century, really valuable. At mm -hmm. the same time, the law of the sea is not all that well developed, and it's not clear mm -hmm. that the law, you know, say, protects them uh, or limits the people who would like to mine them. And so you have the science moving on the one side, you have industry moving on the other side, and you have arguably the law of the sea moving, you know, to try to mediate between those things. And of course, right. concerns about the ecology in general. Right. So why did you go into this, Jessica? I mean, and you know, it sounds complicated, and certainly five years is is, is a biblical period of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> why did you Why did you do this? Did you have some fascination, um, you know, with the ocean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I actually grew up nowhere near the ocean. I grew up um, along Lake Michigan, which you know seems like a freshwater ocean to some, and and so I think that maybe that distance from really ever being near the ocean is what drew me to really wanting to study it and to understand um, more about the animals that live there and, and how they live and how they persist. And um, research was always something that I really enjoyed as an undergraduate student, having, you know, having the opportunity to work in different laboratory spaces and dabble in a little bit of research here and there and really feel like this is, this is cool. I didn't know you could do research as a career and I could ask questions for a living and try to answer them for a living. And so, um, you know, some of those more basic reasons definitely led me into choosing to pursue, you know, a, a degree in oceanography and, um, you know, ending up out here perhaps a little bit by happenstance, but I, I really wouldn't change it for the world. I think falling into the areas of study that I have and getting to collaborate with folks at UH that I've been able to, to do over the last five years has been um, just an, an immense undertaking and, and privilege for me, so. Now, the difference between us is you get to ask questions and satisfy your curiosity for a living and they pay you for that. I get to ask questions and they don't pay me for that. There's, <laughs> there's a difference, but we can be equally curious, you know. So when you right. looked at it from the shores of Lake Michigan and you looked, you know, around the country and the world for that matter, because this is, you know, a global science for sure. Mm -hmm. um, what attracted you to UH? What attracted you to SOAS? Um, I have to say, I um, when I first found out about SOAS and the programs here and had the opportunity to um, to chat with and have some discussions with faculty, uh, it, it struck me that this was a place that was ripe with opportunities and, um, you know, getting getting to hear about the active research going on here and the importance of some of that research really um, I think that's what led me to feel like this was this was an area that I would like to study, and this is a place that I would like to pursue this degree. And um, you know, and I guess five years ago, and I first had a chance to to talk with my P my former PhD advisor about the kinds of projects that um, that that particular lab was interested in and studying, and the areas that I could come in and you know enhance that research and develop my own research. Um, it just seemed like a really great learning environment with a lot of really great people. Um, 
and I, I'm yeah. glad I took took the risk. <laughs> and you can and you stay in touch with them through the whole period. They're right there in Manoa, mm -hmm. and there's some Absolutely. of them doing long term research projects. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Dave Carl, you know, and the National Academy of Science, who who um, you know has um, have been working on projects that go decades and decades and decades. Um, did you have to go out in the ocean? Did you have to do dive? Did you have to take those UH uh, ships around and, and drop instruments? Tell us about that. Yeah, quite a bit, actually. Um, for a, a good part of my research um, involved going out on two very long cruises um, out into the middle of this area that I was just talking about that's that's being targeted for mining. So it was, you know, a, a five or six day steam from the nearest port just to get out there and um, being out on these ships for 45 or 50 days at a time, um, dropping all sorts of instruments into the water and trying to assess the general uh, ecosystem baseline, if, if you have it, uh, just what's going on in these areas that really haven't been studied all that much. Uh, and in terms of what we dropped in the water, we dropped a lot of different instruments to measure different properties of water. So um, instruments to measure temperature and salinity, um, and productivity and oxygen, um, you know, different variables that might affect the animals that, um, you know, I personally was more interested in studying. Uh, we were able to tow really big nets behind ships to collect a lot of the small fish and crustaceans and squid um, that we were aiming to study. Uh, you don't, you don't even, eat them or anything. What, what? No, <laughs> they, uh, they don't smell so great all the time when they come up and <laughs> probably not as tasty as a fish you might be more used to eating. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just, you know, a lot of fun being able to dabble in, in different aspects of oceanography, being out at sea, collecting different, um, yeah, different measurements, different animals. Um, one of the collections I was able to do quite a bit was uh, acoustic data collection. So kind of sending sound waves down into the water to uh, reflect off animals and get a sense of where they are in the water column and how they're behaving. Um, and so that was a lot of fun to, to try to use this tool that would allow us to sample a lot more space um, and for a lot longer time than just being out there on a ship in the middle of the ocean. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to drill down on that. It's not it's not a pun. I want to drill down <laughs> on water column. I want to drill down on pelagic. And when I first saw the title of your PhD, which was uh, <clears throat> let me let me read this just so I know what I'm saying. It's uh, oceanographic influences on pelagic uh, ecology, acoustics, and combined sampling approaches. I, I don't know if you can put that to music, actually. You have to really, <laughs> really work at it. First thing I said, pelagic, is this some sort of skin disease, a skin condition? <laughs> because if I watch NBC long enough, I'll, I'll find 10 modern, high-tech, cutting-edge drugs that will help me with my pelagic skin condition. But it's not that at all, is it? What does pelagic not mean? Quite. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Um, pelagic means open ocean. So um, if you think about different habitats in the ocean, you might think of coral reefs or um, habitats that are right offshore that you can see just you know from hopping in the water. And when you think about pelagic, it's when you move further offshore and suddenly the water gets quite a bit deeper and you have these increasing expansing, expansive volumes of, of water that have no no boundaries in the horizontal and might be further and further away from the seafloor. Um, that's what we're referring to when we say pelagic. So it's just the kind of the whole water column, nowhere near shore, nowhere near the seafloor. You know, I was talking before about that, you know, one foot square of water, mm -hmm. but you're not putting your arms around that. You're putting your arms around the mm -hmm. whole thing. And, and actually, it's it's so it's beautiful to think of it that way, isn't it? I mean, you're putting Absolutely. your scientific arms around the whole enchilada. You know, it's it's <laughs> it really it really is a beautiful experience. So. It is, yeah, a lot to take in. But... Yeah. Why that? Why did why did you turn in that direction? I imagine you had a meeting with one of your former <laughs> advisors because right now they're all former advisors, former mm -hmm. advisors or former committee members. Hi guys, yes. you can call them by the first <laughs> names, everything. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> so you sat down with somebody and 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 he said, Jessica, you know, what about doing ocean oceanographic influences on pelagic ecology? Is that what happened? Or did you wake up at two in the morning and decide it? 
<laughs> uh, maybe somewhere in, in between. It was maybe more a, a year or two of taking all the questions buzzing around and trying to fit them together into a coherent story of several chapters. So with a dissertation, you have you know three or more chapters of, of different projects and trying to fit them all into a topic or a category, hence the very long name of, of a dissertation as you uh, have found out. Um, yeah, but I, I think a lot of the questions that I was interested in and that my lab uh, was focused on um, fell into this this really large habitat, the pelagic ocean. And part of the reason for that is there's just not been a whole lot of focus on studying some of these habitats. Um, as you can imagine, they're they're quite hard to get to. Um, you know, it takes several days just to steam there in a ship. Uh, they're a bit out of sight and out of mind for a lot of people and, and you know, the amount of money and time and, um, you know, resources that it takes to get out there makes them quite difficult to study. And so being able to contribute research in an area that um, certainly needs it and is certainly important to study, but has perhaps been a bit neglected overall, I found to be a, a good reason to pursue it. Oh, yeah. Well, so um, let's talk about... Um influences on pelagic ecology. You, you wanted to identify them, you wanted to measure them. Um, what are the influences on, I know we only have a few minutes, but uh, on <laughs> what, what did you find? What are the ones that count? Yes, that is a great question. Um, so I, I was interested at different scales of influence. And so thinking at the scale of this whole massive region that I've mentioned before, um, you know, what, what oceanographically drives the behaviors of some of the animals that live in this really big region. Um, and at that really broad level, um, I found that uh, one of the biggest drivers is something called an oxygen minimum zone. Um, and that's a really big feature in this region. And it's basically um, a, an area of the water column that has really, really, really low oxygen. And so it's, as you can imagine, quite hard for a lot of animals to live there because there's just not enough oxygen. And so while you do have some animals especially adapted to living there, it, it drives the behaviors of a lot of, uh, you know, different communities living in that area, maybe makes them live at shallower depths so they are not, you know, migrating too deep into these really low oxygen waters. Uh, so at, at a really broad scale, we found that that was a, an important oceanographic influence. And at smaller scales, um, one of the things we found really important was uh, what we call mesoscale features or or features that are on the scale of just a couple, you know, 10 to 100 kilometers. And that includes features such as eddies. Um, and eddies, you can think of as these, these water masses uh, propagating across this big region, um, rotating bodies of water that have their own unique properties to them and can affect, uh, you know, a particular area for a finite period of time, perhaps a, a week or a month. Um, and, and we found that uh, a lot of animals are actually responding to the passage of these eddies coming through this region at, at smaller spatial and smaller time scales. So um, in a in a broader context, putting this into something like deep sea mining that we were just talking about, if you really want to understand how mining might be affecting this ecosystem or changing the behaviors of these animals, you have to understand the, the natural scales of variability in their behavior. And so that was what what we were aiming to do. Wow, that really, really sounds really interesting. And when you think about, you know, the different areas in the world and how it might be different from one to the other and how it might have mm -hmm. participated or uh, influenced the, um, the evolution of the animals mm -hmm. that are in the water column. Um, you know, I'm sure that when you go and look at them today in a snapshot kind of way, um, you have to think about where they've been for the last 100,000 years and how right. they have evolved and therefore how the oceans have changed for them in the last time. Wow, that's pretty exciting. Right. And how they might change in the future, right? Yeah, yeah, wow, exciting. So, okay, so how, how long did it take you to write the uh, dissertation? You know, it's a, it's a threatening word for anybody who hasn't done it. In fact, I would say it's a threatening word for everybody who, who has done it. Yeah, so, the, the, the feelings it brings up are, are always gonna be there. Uh, <laughs> For me, I, I kind of spread it out across the whole process. So I, I never had to sit down for months and months at the end just to just to write it all. I kind of took it one project at a time, did all of the, you know, the research, collected the data, did the analysis, wrote up a chapter, moved on to the next, maybe worked a little bit on the other projects here and there, but 
definitely spread it out over probably about two and a half or three years. Um, is that is that common? Is that typical? I, yeah, I think there's a mix. I, I think part of it just depends on on how things work out and how your data collection and, and research flow just just turns out. Um, and I, I was fortunate that it that it turned out in a way that allowed me to just progress through each of these chapters in a, in a more fluid way, I think, than trying to cram at the end and just put it all together. So, so uh, are you expected to send drafts to your advisors um, and, and connect the dots with them and get some ideas about where to go next on this? Is, is it a, a sort of a, an exchange of ideas? Mm -hmm. Is it a collaborative effort in that way? Absolutely, yeah, it's very collaborative uh, between you and your committee and you and your co-authors. Um, you know, I, I say me here, but certainly none of this was done alone and, and all of the ideas and analysis and research have had, you know, lots of exchange among um, all of the people involved and, um, you know, yeah, they're, everything that goes into a dissertation is a, is a team effort, but at the end of the day, it is, you know, you as a PhD student who, who has to really do the brunt of the work and put it all together and connect all the dots, um, obviously getting input along the way. And it's your signature. You're, you, at the end of the day, you're the one who wrote it, and yep. you're the one who has to stand by and defend it. You know? Yes, exactly. That is why they call it a defense. <laughs> Yes, well, I'm interested in that. I mean, I went to law school, and we had defense in law school. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my my impression though is that when you finish a degree like this, and you focus on pelagic ecology, and and the instrumentation and so forth, um, that is actually a narrow aspect of the work you have done because in the process you have learned about all kinds of alternative and additional things about the way animals work, the way the oxygen works, the way the sea swells and the eddies work. Um, and so you're, you're only covering, uh, putting it this way, you're only covering a small amount of what you've learned and you have learned lots more than what you write about. Am I right? Yes, you're a hundred percent correct. It, it, at the end of the day, it feels, like you've done a lot more work than you're really able to kind of put in, in the booklet at the end of the day, and even less so that you're able to present in a, you know, 45 minute defense uh, at the end of it all. So everything you learn along the way, all of the, you know, the methods and the tools and the different topics, some that you might, you know, go down one route and decide, you know, that's not working or, you know, you don't want to pursue that. And there's a lot of trial and error that nobody sees at the end of the day. It's just the finished dissertation. <laughs> so uh, how, how long is it? What, six, 7,000 pages? What? Oh, <laughs> a couple hundred pages. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that might take a bit more than five years. <laughs> <laughs> how many chapters? Uh, uh, mine is about five chapters. There's three data chapters and then an introduction chapter and a conclusion chapter. And I think that's maybe the, the standard length. Okay, and it, and then the the English has to be perfect. Um, that I know that from talking to people who've taken PhDs, you really have to be <laughs> careful about every word, and you know the the grammar, the the punctuation, all that. Uh, what about the footnotes? Um, is it loaded mm -hmm. with footnotes? You have a, a separate bibliography of footnotes. Uh, definitely a lot of appendices and supplementary information, and and a ton and tons and tons and tons of references. You know, you pull thoughts and ideas and comparisons from a lot of different published work. And um, yeah, there, there's a lot more than just the actual research that goes into it. So what are the footfalls you want to avoid in writing a dissertation? I mean, I suppose you, you don't want to misquote uh, a source or reference, mm -hmm. an authority. Um, you don't want to come to the wrong conclusion uh, about, you know, how to how to how to put it all together. What else? I mean, what mm -hmm. what what are the things you're trying to steer clear of? Yeah, that's a great question. And part of the reason um, that it's nice to have a committee to, you know, to go through everything with and make sure that you are making the right conclusions or at least that everybody's in agreement uh, on those conclusions. Um, I think when you, you know, if you go to publish those individual chapters and in journals, um, you have this whole peer review process. And so you actually have people completely external to what you've been working on that might come in and, and have, 
you know, a lot of gripes perhaps with what you've written that neither you or your co-authors or committee may have had. And so um, there's a lot of uh, not really knowing what, you know, whether what you've written is um, incorrect in the eyes of somebody else until you go through that process. And um, certainly also maybe realizing mistakes that you and your committee who have been looking at the same work for several years now might have missed. Uh, so you definitely want to go into that review process trying to make sure you've dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. But um, at the end of the day, there's there's some amount of just not knowing until you until you go through that process. Yeah, but you know, when you when you say peer review, when you say, well, these people have to agree um, that your work is right, that your conclusions are right and defendable and so forth, yeah, don't you have the risk that there's somebody out there in the scientific community going to say, Jessica, you're all wet. <laughs> Isn't that possible? Absolutely. And, you know, to some extent, nobody's ever right. And, you know, we're all wrong to some extent. And I think there's a there's a, uh, a skill to the way that you write a scientific publication, because it is really difficult to say with absolute certainty what you found and what your conclusions are, are, you know, are what they are. And so there's, um, there's definitely a certain way of writing that leaves room for error that leaves, you know, a lot of your conclusions might be suggestions, for example, because you, you know, at the end of the day, you really might not be able to prove with absolute certainty what you are trying to say. And I, I think there's rarely a, a circumstance where you are truly able to prove something is 100% fact. But the idea is that you are advancing science. That's the mission, isn't it? You are making yes. a material contribution to, to the state of science in this area. Isn't that what it is? It is. Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, you, you do as much as you can and, um, you know, try to put that information out into the world to be used, to be you know, put into management or, you know, just to kind of expand the basic knowledge of the field that you're studying. So, um, I, you know, inherent in all of this is that when you finish a paper like this and you go through the, the process, um, you get published, right? Uh, so where is this going to be? Is it going to be in the the food section of the Star Advertiser? <laughs> is it going to be on Civil B or maybe Pacific Business News? Where will I be able to find your work? Uh, well, you can find the uh, whole dissertation on the ProQuest website. Um, they published uh, entire dissertations. And then each of the individual chapters will be published uh, in different uh, oceanographic journals. So um, yeah, a handful of different journals that I can certainly share the links with, but. Um, okay, well, that's great. So now what about tuning it up, you know? So you've, you've done it, you defended it, you got through. Um, you're going to get your PhD soon enough. You're going to get published on these various sites. I was only kidding about the Star Advertiser. If we saw, <laughs> if we saw your dissertation, dissertation on the Star Advertiser, I, for one, would need smelling salts. Um, <laughs> but, but what about tuning it up? You know, what about you stumble into something? six months down the road, a year down the road, and in the course of other work that you do, you say, oh, wait a minute, you know, I want to add something, I want to change something, um, I want to expand this, uh, I want to make a, uh, you know, a, 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 um, something else about it, another paper mm -hmm. or an expansion of the existing, what about that, does that happen? Yeah, I, I think that's more common than not, uh, especially when you become such an expert in, in whatever area of expertise that you've spent the past five or more years studying, um, I think you do relate a lot of what you do down the line, your future research back to what you know so well from that dissertation work. Um, and I think a lot of new ideas for projects and a lot of expansion of the work that you might have done during a PhD um, into your future research is, is probably more common than not. And I'm excited to try to answer some of the questions that we weren't able to answer along the way just in in the five years that I had to uh, to conduct all the science that I did during my PhD. And so I, I think that's something to look forward to. So uh, you were telling me before the show that uh, you got a job out of all of this and uh, <laughs> you will be paid for your curiosity. <laughs> and it's a research job, am I right? Um, it is, yes. So it's a continuation of the academic experience, except you this time, you know, you get paid for your time um, <laughs> and your product. And so what, what is that job? What is it going to be like? And, and let me go further and say, how do you see your career unfolding, you know, in, in 
ecologic ecology? Um, all great questions. Uh, I'm now uh, working at the NOAA Fisheries Center at um, Fort Island. So it's the Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center. Uh, and I'm able to take a lot of the skills and tools I learned during my PhD to answer some similar questions and some slightly different questions, uh, particularly about some um, you know, local fish communities around Hawaii and the U.S. Pacific Islands and trying to understand, um, you know, what what are the oceanographic influences on on some of these different communities of animals. And then also continue expanding those questions into the pelagic, uh, you know, everything is connected. So a lot of a lot of what happens to nearshore communities has, uh, you know, influences or is influenced by what's happening to offshore pelagic communities. And so trying to couple and better understand the interactions between you know, what's happening close to shore and what's happening offshore is it's definitely an interest moving forward and um, hopefully something that my career will allow me to continue to pursue and ask questions about for the next uh, hopefully oh, foreseeable well, future. 100 years or so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so what about these uh, former committee members uh, and former uh, advisors, you know, the ones you now call by their first names? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Will you have contact with them? Will you have, uh, you know, either formal or schmooze contact with them going forward? Certainly, yeah. I think, um, you know, one of the nice things about being able to work with the committee for so many years is you build up a, a network of people who are experts in the various topics that you're also interested in. And so having having a rapport with them already and having collaborated with them already makes it a lot easier, um, you know, to both collaborate and continue interacting with them in the future, whatever future projects come up and, and just, you know, interesting topics in oceanography that you want to discuss with people that you've been able to discuss for the last five years or so. Um, I look forward to keeping those connections. Oh, yeah, that's great. You know, and, and of course, uh, I'm sure in the last five years, you've had contact with other people doing other research and other institutions uh, in mm -hmm. the U.S. and elsewhere. And um, so part of being a scientist, uh, wow, did, did people call you scientists and everything? I bet they do. I'll call you scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Feels so, very formal. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, when you have, when you have, when you grow this community of people who are you know, also into the same area or similar areas of research, now you have a, a, a global network and you can send your papers to them. They'll send their paper. Is this what it's like? I mean, how much how much connection connectivity do you have now, and how much connectivity do you think you'll have going forward? Uh, that's a great question, and and I've actually been able to have quite a bit of connectivity uh, during my PhD. Um, some of the biggest collaborators that I've had are actually folks over in New Zealand um, that I connected with just out of you know curiosity and having questions and. Um, you know, choosing to reach out to folks. And I've found that building connections um, through that that uh, communal curiosity has been really, really rewarding. And I think the people that I've had a chance to work with both throughout the US and internationally will be people I continue to work with um, for years and years. And I think that sets a good precedent for how I'd like to go about expanding that network of, of people down the line and into the future. Yeah, and, and that's a, a measure of your success. Um, the, the quality of your community is a measure of your success. You heard it here on Think Tech. But um, <clears throat> let, me, let me just ask you one more question. And I, I'm trying to put myself in the room with you when you, when you fin a few weeks ago when you finished you know, your defense and everything. So you have a committee, you're in the room. Um, mm -hmm. Are you sitting or standing? And if you're standing, do you have to stand at attention uh, if, if you're sitting, can you have a glass of water with you? Um, and do they sit? And how many of them are there? And you know, what's the attitude in the room? What's the mm, the tone uh, and tenor mm -hmm. of the conversation? So I think that varies depending on the committee and and even perhaps the the university. Um, for me, it, there is well, there's the public defense, so that's giving a big presentation to um, to the public. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, a well-prepared presentation and you're standing and walking around and, and trying to answer people's questions. And then once that completes, everyone leaves the room and then you're right, it's just you and your committee. And it was about an hour and a half of uh, the committee asking me questions. And 
um, really more just having a discussion with me about the broader implications of all the research, um, additional questions that people hadn't thought of previously or, or interests. And um, I have to say it, it was a lot more, uh, it was a lot more of a discussion than I had expected. It was nothing like the comprehensive exams that you take two or three years into your degree when you're just getting drilled on everything you know about oceanography. And it really feels like you're the expert and you're having a conver you know, a conversation with your peers about all of the research that you've done. Um, and you know, we were sitting, we were standing, we were joking, and um, yeah, it, it was a it was a great atmosphere, to be honest. It's great. And and I have the sense that when, when you when you are drilling down in that conversation with them on something that you've been focusing on in your research, actually, you know more than they do. <laughs> it's a good feeling. <laughs> it's a reversal from feeling like you don't know nearly as much as anybody else to actually, I do know a bit more about this particular topic at this moment. <laughs> Oh, what a great experience in life. I, I envy you, uh, you know, your success, your achievement, and your future. It's, it's wonderful to talk to you, Jessica, and uh, I hope we meet again, and I wish you well in all particulars. Thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate you having me, and it's been a great chat. Jessica Perlman, and, and please call her doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Aloha. Thanks so much. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.